next speaker is the South Australian candidate, many of you know him, Mr John Bolton. John, John has been an Australian who's been concerned about the dismantling of secular Australian values and the dangers that this brings to freedom, to freedom, democracy and human rights. John came to Australia with his parents as a teenager in 1971, enrolled as a police cadet and readily embraced Australian culture and lifestyle. He was married for 38 years to his late wife, Julianne, and they raised two sons who were on the path of family life themselves. John has been a community leader of groups such as Scouting, Rotary International, as well as school and sporting clubs. He has volunteered as a teacher of English and as a second language to immigrants. First as a police officer, then as a lawyer for the Crown, and later in private legal practice, John has worked with and became friends with Aboriginal people in their lands. John continues to work on health and domestic safety for women and children, as well as equity programs. He has been politically, politically active and lobbied governments on free speech, child protection, loss of manufacturing industries, domestic, domestic violence, fishing resource management, the right to self defence, the right to self defence in the home, wastages of taxpayers' money, inequity in Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal and immigration issues. This is why he's so pleased with the breadth of the 20 key policies of Australian Liberty Alliance. When leading Islamic groups made submissions to the Australian Senate that Sharia should take priority over Australian law, alarm bells should be ringing for everyone. John points out that it's not racist to oppose a totalitarian ideology and not un-Australian to require compliance with Australian laws. These problems need to be addressed immediately, but instead of open and rational discussion, it has become increasingly difficult to raise the topic. John and the Australian Liberty Alliance Party, with your support, will change that. Please welcome our South Australian candidate, if you're offended by the truth, if telling the truth hurt your feelings, then you're at odds with mainstream Australia. Our constitution was recently revisited in Burns case back in November. And the federal court says that in Australian political discourse, it is riddled by hurt feelings and being insulted. That's what we do here in Australia when we discuss political issues. This is different to Islamic run countries. In Saudi Arabia in 2011, they changed the law. They redefined what terrorism is. In Saudi Arabia, it is terrorism to criticize the government or the royal family, which is virtually the same thing. That is just one reason why over the last couple of years, I say unashamedly, Australian culture is, as a matter of fact, better than Islamic culture. <laughs> whether it hurts your feelings or not, whether it offends you, it's the truth to say that freedom, Australian freedom, is better than slavery. Now that sounds really old-fashioned, except when you see the professor at Cairo University only last year justifying to jihadi men that it's okay to enslave women as sex slaves. They say that in 2015 and 16, and it is obnoxious to Australian human rights. <laughs> in our country, our Australian women are equal to our men. Yes. Democracy.
democracy is better than Hispanic Sharia law. Here in Australia, it is not okay to beat the wife. Okay, we don't have a great record at the moment with domestic violence with one or two women a week being killed. But at least it is against our law. We don't have an ideology that says it's okay behind closed doors to beat the missus up. I object to that. My feelings are hurt by that. In Australia, girls finish school before they get married and have sex at 9, 10, or 11 years old. In Australia, we protect and tolerate minorities in a way that Islam doesn't. There are just some things about Australian culture that are not negotiable. And freedom of speech is one of them. But Australians right now, Australians are giving away Australia. Giving it away without even a fight. Economically, we're selling the farm. Socially, we're committing cultural suicide. And in our society, Islam has started the way it does in every one of its host cultures that it intends to take over. It starts off slowly. It starts off as a minority group. It says that, that we're easily offended, we're small, we're, we deserve protection, we need special laws. That's what they say everywhere they go. But of course, Islam is a gigantic global power. Whole states, large countries, they control an enormous amount of wealth from oil. And this oil wealth is pumping the idea of aggressive Islam around the world. It's poisoning societies wherever it goes. It's stultifying education. It's making a cult of death and suicide and murder. One good thing about opposing Islam is you never have to make bad stuff up. It just is there. <laughs> and it makes big claims for itself. It says that it's the final revelation that God spoke to this one illiterate man somewhere in Arabia, resulting in material that is largely, by the best authorities, plagiarised from the Old Testament and the New Testament. But this is different, of course. It's the final revelation. It's unalterable. And those who don't accept it are to be treated like animals and slaves. Well, I don't accept it. And when they say, behead those who speak against Islam, or even cartoon Islam, why don't they get arrested for hate speech? I might get into trouble just for saying these things about Islam and Muhammad. I say to Australia, where are your priorities? You're giving away free speech. You're giving away one of the most precious things about our Australian society. We're giving it away without <coughs> Many Australians are even praising the people who want to deny them the right to resist it, this right to re free speech. I say, shame on them, appeasers of Islam. I want a line drawn in the sand. It's against Australian law to incite children to kill. And yet in Parramatta at the mosque, the, the boy of weapons carrying age, I know that we call them children here, but in Islamic society, it's weapons carrying age, picks up a gun in a mosque at Lekan. Uh, so it's against the law to incite children to commit murder. But it seems that when these offences are encouraged or procured by promising these young mind ridiculous notions of what's going to happen to them if they get killed themselves while they're doing it, that this seems to be acceptable in Australia, and I say it's not. Why is this criminal incitement permitted to occur it can't be allowed, according to some culture or ancient religious dogma. Yet, it seems to be the case that if it's part of a prayer session or a religious meeting, it's okay to incite these criminal activities. And our authorities are permitting it. It's not an exception to Australian criminal law to mutilate the genitals of little girls here in Australia. And yet we have now not one, 
but two specialist clinics, one in Sydney and one in, Australia, in Melbourne, to deal with these things. And yet we've only got one prosecution. Why is that so? It's an offence. In it's indefensible by ideology in Australia. It's an offence here to marry a nine-year-old child. And yet we have nine, ten, eleven, twelve-year-olds getting married at the rate of 250 a year in Sydney and Melbourne. And yet one prosecution occurs. What is happening with the leadership in our country when these things are happening? In Australian family law, often complained about by both, both men and women, but the starting point is generally equality of, of property separation not to automatically award the husband twice the wife. And yet we now see presented to our own Australian family court what I call a bastardisation of the system. Young women who were inculcated with their local Sharia communities get bullied into a settlement which is then lodged with the family court as though it's been an alternative dispute resolution. And so they get in Sharia settlements, unfair ones, endorsed by our own family court. Australian domestic violence laws don't permit physical chastisement. And yet here in Australia, such dogma is preached every Friday in the mosques and at the Sharia schools. Why is that so? These people don't seem to be touched or attacked or targeted by the millions of dollars that we're aiming to prevent domestic violence in Australia. Why is it they're still allowed to preach the exact opposite that we as Australians stand up for? I say it's time to stop being scared. These sorts of things are not excused. They're not accepted by our constitution. They're not excusable by some sort of cultural excuse or some sort of religious ideological idea. These are not defences to crimes in Australia. They are crimes. And incitement of them is a crime, even if it's incited by some ancient, medieval, totalitarian ideology. Islam is bad. <laughs> Let's draw that line in the sand. Let's stop apologising to the perpetrators who use this totalitarian ideology to protect their crimes and their powers. And let's instead protect the victims. And all we have to do in Australia to do that, in our own country, all we have to do is enforce our own law. But we are failing. And if things go according to the plans of the Islamists, who are at war with us, they declare that whether our country, our government admits it or not, they're at war with us. And if things go according to their plans, we're going to have to go beyond the worst excesses the worst events that are already happening in France and Germany and England, before enough of these apologists, the so-called progressives, even admit that Islam is the problem. And that concerns me greatly because I don't see that upswell. Even in Europe now, only 20% of people are voting for anti-Islam parties, and they have, they have rates on the streets, a thousand interferences of women in Brussels. I say that neither of the two major parties here in Australia, the Liberals or the Labour, they don't represent the concerns of sensible centre Australia anymore. <laughs> ordinary concerns of ordinary Australian citizens are being delegitimised by the mainstream parties, by these political elites who were all left-leaning and who were set, setting the agenda for us. Ordinary Australians' concerns are being let down and not just passively attacked by the media, but aggressively attacked by the media. In South Australia, we did once have a warrior. Senator Xenophon was a warrior for South Australia. He did stand up as that intermediate stream. But I say he's bored in that gravy train that he once used to satirise. And he's been a politician now for getting on for 20 years. I say Senator Xenophon has sold out. I say he's a mainstream politician. I say he's a vote-seeking opportunist. I say his version of pop-up populist politics and appeasement to Islam 
meat that is sold out. He's attending mosques in Toowoomba where he's launching a candidate inside the mosque seeking Islamic votes. He's meeting with the Muslims. Yeah, the photos are there. The photos are there. He doesn't care how he gets back into power and he's seeking to appease Islam. He meets with the Muslims. He goes overseas with the Muslims. I say this leaves a vacuum in South Australia. The need for a new, sensible, centre, moderately conservative party and I say, step up, Australian Liberty Alliance. Yeah. I thank the board. I thank the board very much for bringing the Australian Liberty Alliance into existence and the Q Society before it. And I thank them for bringing me on board as the lead Senate candidate in South Australia. It's a great position for me to be in. The Australian Liberty Alliance's party manifesto is very, very broad. It's simply a lie to say that the ALA is a single-issue party. Now, I heard that lie being told. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't hear it with my own ears in Perth. It was after Peter Wilders was over and I was listening to the local radio station, and they specifically brought in a professor from the Western Australian University who was a specialist in... in politics and she came into the radio station and she said oh, I followed Debbie Robinson and she's from the Hughes Society she's a single issue person the Australian Liberty Alliance has only got one policy well I've been reading the manifesto it's 20, 20 separate paragraphs and this person's supposed to be the expert and she's either telling a lie or she's not an expert <laughs> Becoming a party member, and you've heard from my uh, CV, thank you for that introduction, Andrew. I have been involved in many of these areas uh, as a political activist since I semi retired and shut down my business a few years ago. You know, when you're running a, a, a local business, you can't really afford to say things politically. But since retiring, the brain keeps going, and I actually retain my vaccine certificate and I do different things. So I became very involved. One was over there from, from replay, and I became quite involved with one that had. Uh, because those are the sorts of things that the press are going to bring out in an attempt to, uh, to denigrate the sorts of things I've been doing. So I'll, I'll address that briefly in a moment. But it's great that the ALA stands for all these policies, and I'm not going to read them out to you, but as a South Australian candidate, I think I should just launch some of these issues. We stand for reducing the number of politicians, reducing the cost of government bureaucracy, and stabilising the federal government. Now, wouldn't that be a great idea at the moment when we don't even know when and where the election's going to be and it's chosen? We say stabilise the terms of government and we say four-year terms. We stand for integration of Australian community, equal rights and obligations. When you come here, you don't just have rights, you have obligations as well. And one of the obligations is for you to fit in with us and not the other way around. <laughs> we welcome immigrants. I, you've heard me, uh, my CV, I, I volunteer, I speak English as a second language to immigrants. Australia is uh, written on the back of immigrants over the last 200 years, and it's great. We don't, we're not an anti-immigration party. But we do want to stop the Islamification of Australia. And those of us who have been doing that, you start off, you think you're on your own, and then you discover things. You find out about the Jewish society. You, you read how they've intellectualised the argument here in Australia. And before I became a party member, I said I wanted to stop Islamic immigration permanently until those who are already here obey our laws. So I'm quite happy to accept the moratorium for 10 years, uh, which is a party policy. I say Australian law comes first. So when I do read the Federal Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee report, an inquiry into immigration and multiculturalism, and you see that report and you go behind it and you look at the input and you see two major Islamic bodies say that Sharia law should be a parallel legal system in Australia, and they say they're happy with that, isn't that great of them? But a condition that they set down is that where Australian law differs from Sharia, then Sharia should dominate. That's what they say. I'm not making this stuff up. That's what the submission is to our own federal government. So I say this to Islamists. 
this is never going to be your country. This is never going to be an Islamic country. The deal is done before you come to Australia. We're not going to renegotiate this once you get here. Australia will never be your country. Australian law comes first, and there's no place for Sharia here. You've heard how I've been involved with the Aboriginal friends uh, uh, who started off as clients, but over the last 20 years I've worked for the state government, I've worked uh, negotiating with and for Aboriginal people and so forth. I've become great friends and started to love the country. The policy of the Australian Liberty Alliance is that there should be a real reconciliation. and We're all Australians. Uh, we mustn't be separated by special racial discrimination laws. We oppose the Noel Pearson proposal for a separate, constitutionally entrenched federal Aboriginal power base. That's his latest trip. Now, I go one step further. I say I'm an Australian, and I say as an Australian, Aboriginal heritage is part of who I am as an Australian. I love and I enjoy my deep relationship with Adima, the country, and the people who live there. Now, I claim this Aboriginal heritage as a white person. I claim it in the same way that Noel Pearson <coughs> claims parliamentary democracy as part of who he is as an Australian of Aboriginal descent. And I say that's the way forward. Together, we recognise, I recognise as a white person, that Aboriginal heritage is here, and Aboriginals recognise that we have one government, and we all need to get together and work towards a future together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only up to policy five. I'll scatter, I'll scatter through some others later, but there's a few that I've quite uh, quite important. Policy number five is that immigration must uh, fit to the needs of Australia for a livable Australia. We say that this means that immigration can fluctuate and it can fluctuate downwards. It's all very well in time of economic expansion to bring in people, but in time of economic downturn, then there's no reason why immigration shouldn't go down according to the needs of Australia. And that's the starting point, the needs of Australia. There should certainly be no ethnic enclaves uh, permitted, as they are already starting to happen. 42% Muslim in the Canberra, 38% in Auburn. These are the forerunners of no-go Sharia exclusive zones. These zones are Zones of barbarity which riddle Europe and they provide havens for Islamic terrorism. We see that in the news. We're not making this stuff up. We have policies regarding affordable clean energy. Uh, we say a single citizenship only if you're Australian. You are welcome to come here, but you need to become Australian and you need to follow our laws. We won't be funding special ethnic groups. If you come to Australia, join an Australian group. If you want to have your own little group, then we're not paying for it. <laughs> we have policies regarding health care, ageing and dignity, or we've got uh, education policies. We say back to core education, not social engineering, not teaching sexual queerness, using their word, not mine. <laughs> regarding free trade, securing Australian jobs, foreign affairs, environmental protection and so forth. All of those are in detail, they're available in the manifesto. One of the issues that's important to me is that the party wants to advance the natural family. Now everybody here knows exactly what I mean when I say that. And having practiced in the Federal Family Court for quite a long time, and rarely studied the law, our Australian law has never needed to define what marriage is. We all know what marriage is. It's between a man and a woman. And it's not until the... It's not until the social engineers get over it that the Howard government eventually, after how long we've been here, 200 years or something, and 100 years of federation, it's not until the social 
engineers get a hold of it, but all of a sudden the government says, well, we better define it as a man and a woman, because we actually know what it is. And the reason we know what it is is because it's been going on since time immemorial. It's never had to be defined. Our British Australian common law didn't have to define the bleeding obvious. It na it's marriage between a man and a woman, and it naturally produces children. It's the foundation and core of who we are as people, who we are as Australians. And as a matter of truth, whether it offends you or not, it's essential to the continuation of our species of humankind, and for that reason alone, it's different from all the other sorts of relationships that people want to call marriage. We say, reserve the word marriage for a man and a woman. Sometimes I'm meeting socially, people say to me, what's this happen about? I've never heard anything about this. I mean, how deeply in the 
understand is their head, head bearing. When we have we have the federal senator Bernardi saying things, when you choose not to buy halal products, you're labeled a racist and a bigot. Okay. <laughs> President Debbie Robinson uh, say not only has she been an instrumental in setting up the Liberty Alliance Party with the other four board members, but also the Q Society. And in, in my opinion, they have intellectualised the arguments against the Islamification in, in Australia in a great way. It certainly was good for me to read when I discovered it a couple of years ago now. I'm not the only person that thinks like this, and you struggle to write things, and uh, Q Society's been there. And one of the best documents that Q Society has come out with, and it is endorsed in our party policy, is the clear roadmap called 12 Practical Steps to Stop the Islamization of Australia. That is quite a detailed document. So whenever you're trying to think about what you need to be thinking about, that's available on the internet. I say together, people like us, and of course much greater people, and a much broader range of people, We've changed the political dialogue in Australia over the last couple of years. I think you can see that. There was once upon a time I'd be at my Rotary Club and people would outwardly avoid me at the bar. And they would say, I think what you're doing is disgusting, in a loud whisper. Now these same sorts of people are actually coming up and speaking to me about these issues because they realise there is a real base behind it. I'm going to go over time, Andrew. Now, of course, we have not converted opponents. We haven't converted these people who want to respect everything, no matter how stupid it is. Respect things no matter how obnoxious they are. Respect things no matter how undeserving things may be, no matter how inhumane. I refuse to respect people who think that a man rode on a horse with wings and a woman's face. You know, I'm not going to respect that. Much of the work that I've done has been speaking to uh, uh, reporters, and it's actually quite difficult to get press. As uh, President Debbie was saying, in fact, a substantial sum of money was refused by an advertiser, even, let alone giving us real balanced press. And so, after spending some time writing and lobbying with every level of government and lobbying all of the uh, reporters that I could uh, find. I ended up uh, making contact with the people who are running various rallies around the country. And going to those rallies uh, was really important to be able to make that press conference. A lot of the best work I found was meeting with often young female reporters and looking them in the face and saying, why are you not concerned? This is the biggest threat to women's rights in Australia. Yeah. And you know, you talk about gender mutilation, you talk about the right to bash the wife, you talk about uh, women in Saudi Arabia not being able to vote. And this, all of a sudden you can see the lights going on with some people. These rallies were not advancing an agenda that the socialist media wanted uh, to publicise. In fact, precisely the opposite. But to start off with, they came anyway. And so that's why I was assisting and attending. And of course, they were run very well. It was so well, in fact, that the press got quite disappointed. Here in Adelaide, where something like 1,500 people turned up for the first refund rally, it was entirely peaceful. Uh, some good-natured chanting, uh, people speaking to the issues. In fact, it was so peaceful that the news media on Channel 7 spliced in footage from ruckus interstate just to give the impression that the Adelaide Valley was not peaceful. Isn't that right? I, mean, yeah. now, I was amazed because I'd been there the entire time. And I was a bit tentative and I said to the organisers, I'm going to sit over there and if I see any violence at all, I'm going home, I'm not speaking, I'm not going to be a party. But it was actually very peaceful. And there are real targets. If you look at the, the social theory, there are real targets for these rallies. The Islamic community is one, but it's the, perhaps the least important, because they see the news footage of these rallies, and they get the message that there is some resistance out there to their Islamification agenda. Some of them, who would call themselves moderate, they feel a bit uncomfortable about what's going on. But probably no more comfortable than people like you and me when you meet a Muslim, especially one with a full face mask, 
or you go down uh, through the Kemba, through through these zones that are already starting to become enclaves in Australia. I say the precursors of the hundreds and hundreds of European Hispanic ghettos in, in Belgium, and Germany, and France, through the and the more conservative Muslims, the uh, Lacanian Muslims, they uh, become angry uh, and they start to demonstrate that anger. And what that does, though, it shows Lacanian Islam for what it is. It shows their violent reality. It puts them back in the media spotlight instead of allowing them to slide off the agenda of this violent part. The second group of targets for these sorts of uh, pro Australian rallies. Uh, the left, the progressive, regressive, the elites in the politics and media, these people are des desperate to control the Islamic immigration debate. They become incensed when anyone has got the audacity to even question their policies because they have no arguments. They have no actual reasons. They can't tell you Islam is good because Islam is bad. They have no basis for their policy of apology and they struggle to justify it. They're not able to express their policies in rational terms, so they resort to abuse. They use attack words. Islamophobia, fascist, xenophobia. These are meaningless words. They're just abusive phrases because they have no argument. And the publicity annoys them because it shows that they're not controlling the debate as firmly as they want to control it. But the third and most important group of ordinary middle Australians. The average Australian who's concerned about the Islamification of Australia. Ordinary middle Australia has seen and heard enough about what is happening in Europe and Martin's Place and Lakamba and Parramatta, but they're afraid. They're frightened. They're silent by the open threats of the Islamists or the aggressive media. These people watch the TV news and it heartens them to see on television other people standing up for what they actually think. They feel good that people stand up and allow their concerns to be voiced and expressed. It's a bit like if you're standing at a don't walk sign uh, and with a group of people. There's nobody coming the other way but everybody obeys the red don't walk sign. When the first person crosses, everybody goes, well, that's a bad person. <laughs> Maybe the second person. But ultimately, a group of people will cross, and all of a sudden, everybody feels licensed to go that way as well, even though the don't walk sign is still there. <laughs> so people start thinking when they see these things. They may have only held their opinions in private, but now they're starting to feel this social license to think what they actually already thought. One thing about this social license is once you get going on it, it starts to grow and all of a sudden people are doing other things like they might start talking about it and say, oh, I eat more pork than I used to, or I eat more bacon. <laughs> or they might get a hat with an Australian flag on it. And these are just little signs of resistance. They're small, but they're important because the other thing about social license is once you get going on it, you start to do a bit more. And in terms of politics and being uh, resistant to Islam, you're more likely to start reading. You might look up the AOA website. You might look up uh, Q Society. You might start offering an opinion. You're more likely to investigate political alternatives like the Australian Liberty Alliance parties. Ordinary Australians have had their concerns delegitimised by the two major parties. They're being let down by the media, uh, but they're being re-licensed and re-legitimised by pro-Australian groups. And this starts to push them. It pushes ordinary Australians towards a more conservative, sensible centre position. I don't like being called right-wing. I cannot see what is right-wing about standing up for women being equal to men. What's right-wing about that? And I went, Of the 
Islamic immigration debate. Neither of these political parties can be said to represent the concerns of Australian, uh, Central Australians anymore. Large proportions of Australian uh, populations, large proportions of us, are now standing outside political correctness. We have had enough of that. Large proportions of us are saying we're fed up with our politicians appeasing Islam. Large portions of us are saying we've had enough of respecting everything, no matter how hateful or belligerent or violent it might be. Now large proportions of us are starting to stand up and speak out. I say to Islamists, and I'm repeating myself, Australia will never be your country. Australia will never be an Islamic country. I say to every thinking person in Australia, you should criticise, vilify, insult, disparage and ridicule Islamic ideology because that is all that it deserves. And I say to them, I hope it hurts your feelings because every time you breach Australian law, every time you breach human rights, Every time I see another clinic opening up to do with genital mutilation, every time I see a boy given a gun to shoot somebody at Parramatta, I get offended by that. I'm insulted by that. Holsworthy Barracks Attacks 2009, Nader Stabbing Police 2014, Martin's Place Murders, 2015 Anzac Day Attack to run down the police, steal their guns and shoot the crowd, Parramatta Murder. These are just a few. This hurts my feelings that people are doing it in my country. It's my right to judge Islam. It's your right to speak freely about it. It is our right to oppose it. We do not want Islamic barbarism in Australia. Not all cultures are the same, and Australian culture is better than Islamic culture. <laughs> Freedom is better than slavery. Democracy is better than Islamic Sharia law. Protection and tolerance of minorities is better. Free speech is better, and there are some things about Australian culture that are just not negotiable. Please, feel the social license to resist what you know is wrong. Your actions will license others. Take some brochures, hand them out, vote One Australian Liberty Alliance. We are losing right now. We are selling the farm. We are committing social cultural suicide. If people like us don't stand up, we will lose the fight. We have to stop it. Please vote One Australian Liberty Alliance. <laughs>